How you guys doing today? Man, it is a blessing to see you and to be seen. Be with family one more time. Praise God. Listen, if, the God, if God has been good to you, come on, make some noise, y'all. Make some noise. Man, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice. What's going on, brother? Hey, good to see you. Y'all, I'm happy. I don't know if y'all can tell. I am very happy. There's a lot happening. Uh, let me welcome, first of all, everybody that's here. Uh, those of you who are here in person here at the Way of Life Church, welcome, welcome. Good to see you guys uh, yet again. I also want to welcome those of you tuning in uh, online. I saw Pam was online this morning. Say good morning to her. Uh, along with the rest of the crew with that online platform. Uh, if you haven't done so, I really want to encourage you to download our app uh, to connect with us. Uh, it's a way in which you can be connected with us outside this moment. Uh, the sermons, uh, notes will be there, and I'm excited about what we're talking about today. But also, if it's your first, second, or third time being with us, we would love to just say thank you. And the way you can communicate you're here with us for the first or second time is to go to our website, thewayoflifechurch.com slash connect, or you can text the word connect right now on your phone to 832-905-9046. And I'll actually get a link on my phone, and so it will be me. It's not a robot, okay, if you get a response. It's me, uh, you know, right before my Sunday nap. Y'all love my Sunday naps, I'll have to tell you. Uh, just thanking you um, for... Uh, reaching out, being with us today uh, for this worship experience. You can use that same means, that same mechanism, if there's some spiritual act, some move of faith that you need to make. Uh, maybe it's questions about uh, trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, question about baptism, membership, uh, any of those things you can utilize through that link. And so I want to encourage you to, if you're not using it now, maybe you need to take a screenshot. Uh, the Holy Spirit may touch you later. Uh, speaking of new members, y'all y'all know we had some new members last month? We got some new family, new family. Yeah, look at that, Ephraim. New family member. There, we got Ephraim Mosley, Sonia Peterson. Who else we got? And Linda Willis. Awesome. Y'all, that's new family. Got some brothers and sisters. Amen. So excited. We got some more in the pipeline. But again, maybe you've been thinking about it. Maybe you've been kind of connecting with us for a while and you're just ready to jump in, right? Be family with us. We would love to have you and to facilitate and walk with you in life as you walk with the Lord. Well, y'all, I'm, I'm excited not just about today. September is going to be awesome, all right? September is going to be wonderful for a lot of reasons. Let me just kind of walk you through some things. First of all, y'all, we're going to have some people preaching their very first sermons in September. <laughs> so, y'all, we've, we've been walking. It's been over a year uh, that we've been having our, our elder candidates go through training. We've been meeting each week. Uh, so Orlando, Orlando Piper, he facilitated communion. Amen. And uh, John, John Crawford, John Crawford. So in September, both of those gentlemen will be preaching for the first time in, in their training as being uh, potential elders here at the Way of Life Church. So, so that's awesome, y'all, right? That's awesome. Uh, not only will we be having that celebration, but in September on the 18th, we will be celebrating six years. Yes. Our church anniversary. Church anniversary. We didn't get a chance to celebrate last year with COVID. But look here, y'all. We, we got to sanitize and, and praise God. This coming September, right? If we got to wear body suits, we're coming, all right? We're going to be here, and we're going to have some fun. Uh, we're going to have a really special guest speaker. So I, I encourage you to set that calendar date uh, on September 18th. Uh, and we also, what I'm really excited about is a brand new focused series that we're going to be learning about and teaching through for seven weeks. It's called One Another. One Another. 
Uh, if you think about the one another's, if you've heard of the one another's, you know, love one another, uh, members of one another, serve one another, forgive one another, all these one another, there's over 50, over 50 of them in the New Testament. It describes the unique supernatural relationships Christians ought to have with one another. Jesus talked about how people will know that we are his disciples by how we love one another. And so that tells us, just that one statement, that one understanding should give us that the way Christians love one another should be out of this world. It should look like it's from heaven. But the reality is, that's not what people see. That's not even what we experience. And so this seven-week study is for us to not only learn what that type of love looks like, but take steps to apply it in our lives. And I'm not looking for us just to practice one another's on Sundays as a church body, but beyond Sunday, Sunday through Saturday. We're going to be praying that we have more groups to form. We're going to be praying that in our marriages, in our homes, we exhibit this same supernatural love. So I want you to already start praying about what the Holy Spirit will do with this series. We have some goals, some things that are you know, supernatural goals for this series. One, we're looking to have at least 20 life groups, 20 life groups. Right now we have three, okay? We're looking to have 20 life groups just for this seven-week study. So I want you to already be praying uh, and asking the Holy Spirit, am I to be one of those people to facilitate one of those groups? We're looking to invite 1,000 people to participate in this series. That means basically everybody has to invite 10 people. You know, that's not crazy. That's not, you know, some kind of miracle thing that has to happen. That's literally us inviting 10 people to encounter God's Word and potentially experience this supernatural love. And listen, if we do that, I, we didn't even put a number on baptisms. We didn't put a number on professions of faith. But we're fully trusting God that if we make that step of faith, he's going to show up in some kind of supernatural way. Amen? And so we're really serious about it. So I talked about the things leading up. You know, I talked about the preaching and the anniversary. But starting on September 5th or after September 5th, midnight, I think that's Labor Day, we're going to do a 13-day fast, okay? And we're going to get more information about how to fast, but we're going to really be seeking the Holy Spirit submitting to him and expecting great things from him, all right? So you're going to be hearing about one another, y'all, until we finish about one another from now on. Every Sunday, I'm talking about one another, and I hope you will be too, amen? amen. Well, y'all, listen, listen, I'm really excited today, y'all. We are still in our series called Mythology. I hope you've been blessed with it so far. Uh, we have four more messages, including today in this series. And today we're going to be dealing with, you know, something I've heard and you may have heard before, where two or three are gathered. We're going to be talking about that today, and that's going to be in Matthew's gospel. That specific verse is actually Matthew 18, verse 15. Uh, but before we go there, let me thank you for your financial support here at the Way of Life Church. Listen, without your sacrifice, we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't put the word out like we do. We couldn't encourage. We couldn't help people like we do. Praise God. And I, so, I just want to thank you for your sacrificial giving. Now, those of you who are watching, maybe you've watched for a while, and maybe you think, okay, maybe I want to uh, participate and invest in the kingdom work of God at the Way of Life Church. The means by which you can do so are right there on your screen. You can do it electronically, uh, online, cash app, or through the app you can download through your app store. For those of you who are here in person, there's an offering box right outside. But we always tell you to focus on your attitude more than the amount, right? Why do we focus on the attitude? Because God loves a certain type of giver. What type of giver does he love? The Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. And so if you can't be happy about investing in the kingdom work of God, then we need to have the kingdom work on you. Praise God. <laughs> well, listen, let's pray. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning as we go into his word. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to worship and to celebrate and to learn. God, I, I look forward to how you will give us understanding, not that we would just simply know more about truth and who you are and how we should interact with one another, but so that we would live differently, 
that you would transform us, that we have this opportunity, this miracle to encounter your word and to begin to live out your word in this world. And so, God, forgive us of any sins that we've committed. Uh, if, the, if we're distracted, Lord, help us to be focused. If there's the enemy would look to do anything to deter us in this moment and in this hour, we ask for your protection and your provision. God, we are expecting you to do what only you can do through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You know, when I, when I first started, I guess, really seeking to grow and to avail myself uh, to God, I was in my late teens, so to speak. And, and before that, you know, my connection with church would be Sunday mornings. As a matter of fact, I would usually be late on Sunday mornings, and I kind of sat on the back row, right? Because in my mindset, the only thing I needed was the preaching. I didn't need all that singing and all that other kind of stuff, and I, I just wanted the Word of God. But as I started investigating and learning about the Word, that I knew that my connection with other people was important. I knew that I had to do more if I was going to grow in my faith. And so I remember going to, you know, Wednesday night Bible study. Anybody ever been to Wednesday night Bible study? Wednesday night Bible study? Look here, y'all. That was the time we were going to get the Word of God. And so I remember going to the, my first Wednesday night Bible study, and I'm expecting Wednesday night to look like Sunday night. Well, Wednesday night looked like, I don't know, Monday night at 2 a.m. Because it was just the deacon. <laughs> One or two very elderly members and myself. I am the youngest person at the Bible study by decades. It wasn't even close. And I remember when the pastor, as a matter of fact, yeah, when the pastor came out uh, and kind of looked at who all was there, you know, they acknowledged me and did what, you know, churches did, which they thought were, you know, really great things to do, but just utterly embarrassing. You know, if you were new, you had to stand up and say something. Anybody ever been to one of them churches? Oh, man. So, you know, hi, I'm Chris, and, and I'm here to Bible study. Oh, praise God, Amen. And then here's what the pastor said, and I would hear this when I would attend Bible studies that weren't well attended, where two or three are gathered <laughs> in my name, they I shall also be in the midst. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. And so I would hear this phrase, and then I wouldn't hear it just on Bible studies, but if there was a weekend event that the church put a lot of effort into and marketing, right, and they came and did those announcements Sunday in and Sunday out, but nobody showed up. Where two or three are gathered, <laughs> there I am, in my name, there I am also in the midst. And so I was wondering, does Jesus only show up when nobody else shows up, right? That's what I started to <laughs> wondering. Or was it a comfort that if nobody else showed up, at least Jesus showed up? And, and, and it didn't matter if 30 showed up, if you just had two or three. Jesus was there. Then I started to think about, but I, what happens if I was by myself? Am I by myself? You're not with me, Jesus? Is it just at church? What does it mean that where there are two or three being gathered, that you're in the midst? What's the significance of that? That's what we're going to talk about today. From a biblical perspective, we're in this series called Mythiology, the Unbiblical Beliefs of Bible-Believing People. So what should we understand biblically from this idea where two or three are gathered? Well, the way we're going to understand it is by reading it in its context. The actual verse is verse 20 in Matthew 18. But we're going to focus on Matthew 18, 15 through 20. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you some background before we get to verse 15. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and there's an issue that comes up. They're talking about which is the greatest, right? They're talking about themselves being exalted, and he gives them a little lesson using a child. He says, your pride is going to fool around and keep you out of heaven. I'm paraphrasing. He says, unless you humble yourself and become like a child, you won't even get into heaven, right? Y'all trying to be the greatest in heaven, and y'all going to be talking outside the gates if you keep that attitude up. And he says, you need to be humble. 
And then he starts talking about sin. He's saying you got to be careful with one another because you don't want to cause a believer to sin. You don't want to be the reason that another believer sins. There's lots of things that happen in life in the world that tempt us to sin, but you don't want to be one of those things. He says it's better for you to take a millstone. Y'all, that's like a, a heavy cement rock wheel. He says, and tie it around your neck and throw it into the lake. He says, it'd be better for you to die a slow, agonizing death than to be the reason for a believer to fall away, for a believer to sin. And then he gives a, a story about how we ought to be so concerned about one another. He gives a story about a person who has 100 sheep and one goes away. And how you go and find that one lost sheep to try to bring them back. That's how our care should be for one another with a person who wanders away in, in sin. And then he deals with, well, what if I'm not the reason someone sins? What if my brother sins against me? And so that's where we're going to pick up. Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 15. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you, you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Isn't it wonderful how context has a whole different picture? We didn't even mention Bible study. We didn't even mention the, 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 the church cake sale and nobody showed up and nobody bought a cake. What is he talking about? It's some kind of way connected with sin. Now, let's under, understand sin, right? I don't want to assume everybody knows sin, right? We hear this. It's a, it's a church word, right? You really don't really talk about it outside of church. Uh, the word in Greek literally means to miss the mark. And the mark is God, his character, his will. So any attitude or action that doesn't line up with his character or his will misses the mark. And so biblically, it is sin. And so he's dealing with, if you have someone in the fellowship, right, he's talking to his disciples, and they sin against you, you ought to do something about it. And when you do something about it, the way that I call for you to go about it, then you have my authority in doing it, right? Here, here, here's the summation of this. What is this passage about? And what is this two or three gathered and I'm among you? Here's what it's about. That Christ authorizes Christians to restore Christians. Y'all hear me on this? It is an authorization. In other words, he's saying, I have your back. It is not you invoking the presence of God, right? It's not like a seance, right? And we're just calling the spirits. Matter of fact, we're going to go for the spirit. Let's bring Jesus down, right? That's not what it's about. It's not when as soon as two people show up in a room, there he is in an empty seat. It's saying that you have my authority as if I was there, right there with you. And it didn't take me where two or three gathered in agreement with one another in this process of addressing sin. You have my authority. Why do we need to address sin? First of all, we have to understand the significance of sin, right? Because we like to dismiss sin on one end, or we like to highlight certain sins. 
And I need you to understand what all sin does. Sin slanders God. Y'all know what slander is? Slander is a false statement about somebody, right? It's not just saying something. It's saying something that's false. And what we're saying when we are moving in sin, we're saying something about his character that's not true. We're saying something about his values that's not true, right? I I know God says that there's a certain way I should live, but he really doesn't care. I, I, I know God is just, but he really won't do too much about this. And so whatever it is that we are adopting, that we are walking in, so I'm not talking about uh, uh, addressing the, the, the accident, the misstep. I'm talking about uh, uh, the journey, the walk, the conduct that somebody is just comfortable walking in. When they are walking in that, they are slandering God. And the result of slandering God is people fall out. You mean they fall out. They fall out of right standing with God. They fall out of right relationship with one another. Right? Our pride messes with our relationships with one another. Our lies impact our relationships with one another. All these sins don't just have a mystical, spiritual future impact. They impact you right now in real time and real space. People fall with sin. And when people fall with sin, and and the people who are aligned with with Christ, who align with God, do nothing with it, then we fall with them. What we do is, speaking of authorization, is we authorize the slander of God. We're okay with relationships falling out of right standing with God. We're okay with generations being impacted by living a lie instead of the truth. And so, I love says, I need to talk to you about this issue. Love says, I should address this issue with you. Love. Right? But, but no, 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 no. You know, just let people be people. Let's let them do what they want to do. After all, listen, they're going to be accountable. I don't have to sign off for them, but I really don't have to say anything about it. That's really kind of our attitude, right? That's why our churches don't really deal with this too much. Because the value of the day is, listen, let people make their own choice. Let them be accountable to God by themselves. And everybody has to answer to God. But the reason Jesus put this in the text is first of all, he says, you're not really loving them. You wouldn't treat your children that way. Right? They're playing with matches at three years old, and you walk by, well, you make your choice. How many would do that? And if you would, I'm going to hold you accountable with Child Protective Services today. I really would. I'm going to hold you accountable. That's how, out of love. Because to leave you in that vein causes you to fall, damages you, but will also damage somebody else. Love says we need to have a talk. Now, now what's, the, what's the point? What's the aim of this? A lot of times people use this passage, and they describe it as a passage describing church discipline. Anybody heard that? And, and it's true by definition, but the connotation isn't right. Because discipline, we think of punishment. This is how you punish some wayward believer, right? What do you do with them, right? And this is how you get rid of them. We talk about excommunication because it talked about treating them a certain way, and we're going to talk about that. And people think of it in that vein, but that's not the aim of what Jesus is communicating. The aim is not to reject the person who sins, but to restore the person who sins. Remember, sin is a falling away. And your aim is to restore. Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1 says, you who are spiritual should restore a person, right? If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. Do y'all see that? Now, why does he say restore? 
because they've already fallen. They're already out of bounds. They're already in danger. And so spiritual folks ought to be the ones to help, to bring them, right? And sometimes you complain, well, I got to be the one, right? Who needs to do this? You need to do this if you're spiritual. Some of you think, okay, I've done this before. Why am I always the one having to go and talk with people about this issue? And, and I understand the complaint, but that's really an unspiritual complaint, right? That's really a carnal, fleshy thing to be focused on, right? I mean, how many of y'all would feel good with me preaching the Word of God if I'm always thinking Saturday night? Why I always got to preach the Word of God? Why, why, why I got to be used by God? Why do I have to be the one to help people understand spiritual truth, right? It starts to sound like something less to complain about when I put it in the right perspective. Because if you're the one who always has to do that, that means God likes to use you. That's not a bad thing. That, that you might be his favorite instrument to love people when they're in lost places, when they're hurting and can't help themselves. Right? Would, would, would you, can you imagine a doctor that didn't want to say something about your health and, and they knew something about it? Right? I've been having these headaches and they've been really bad. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I hope, hope it goes away. <laughs> right? And you find out. Let's say you complain about that for a year. You come back to that same doctor. Listen, I can't even sleep at night. These headaches are too bad. You know, is there anything you can do? Well, not at this point. What do you mean not at this point? Well, yeah, it was a tumor. When did you learn about last year? How come you didn't want to say anything? I didn't want you to feel bad. I, I didn't want you to be upset. What kind of doctor are you? Right? And so we think it's Christian. To not talk to people about sin. What kind of Christian are you? Jesus says the aim is to restore. The, the person who is spiritual is the one who is facilitating the restoration, right? The only somebody that can help somebody that has fallen is somebody that happens to be standing. Now, one of the things people are concerned about is they think, okay, does this mean I have to be sinless? No, no Christian is sinless. Saints aren't sinless, but saints sin less. And we encourage that in one another. Just like we encourage all the other stuff, the joy, the peace, the faithfulness, we encourage the holiness. And so we have to address it, y'all. Now, now, what does addressing it mean? What are you trying to do? Is it trying to get them to simply, you know, hear you? Now, it's a little bit more than that. Y'all remember uh, when we're looking at verse 15. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your, your brother. Y'all see that? Okay? Gained, right? And just before it, he, he did that whole hundred sheep and one goes away, right? You've, you've lost the person. You found the person who has lost. You brought him back into the fold. But he says, if he listens to you. Right? How many know people can listen and not really hear? <laughs> it's not simply acknowledging something. It's about repentance. Okay, what is repentance? Luke, Luke 17, y'all, Luke 17, 3, in one verse summarizes this whole section in Matthew 18. Luke 17, verse 3 says this. Luke 17, 3 says, pay attention to yourselves. He's talking about the body of believers. He's talking to his disciples. Pay attention to yourselves. And he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Rebuke means to correct. It doesn't mean to lay waste to him. It doesn't mean to ridicule him. Rebuke means to correct. Correct him. And it says, if he repents, forgive him. Now, let me, let me highlight that for a minute, right? Because we think the Christian thing, right? If, it, if a brother is sinning, we're going to be Christian about it. If a sister sins and we're going to be Christian about it, the thing we ought to do is just forgive him. Right? He tells us to forgive. Absolutely. But why does he put this thing in between here now? Why do we need to repent before being 
forgiven. Repent means to, to change your life as a result of change thinking. And the idea is if you don't change your thinking, you won't change your living. I've talked to you guys before about, you know, restaurants, and I can be okay if a restaurant don't serve, that, you know, didn't serve food and in the very best capacity, I can give them another try. I can go another day. But y'all, if I go in the, in the restroom, it's nasty. You're not going to see me anymore. Right? Nasty restroom mean nasty cook, nasty food, nasty body. I'm not going to go there. So now, what difference does it make if I go and talk to the manager and say, listen, I went into the bathroom and the dining room, it hasn't been clean in days. It is filthy. And the manager says, I hear you. Thank you for telling me this. We would love to have your business again. And I come back the next day. And, and there's, there's no comment. Anywhere, no, no signs of spick and span, no, no Swiffer laying in the corner, nothing. You heard me, but you didn't listen. Right? You acknowledged what I said, but you made no changes to address it. There has to be a change. It's like the story I heard of this man. He was getting dressed for church one Sunday morning. He wasn't quite sure what to wear, and he put this outfit on. And so he thought, well, let me go ask my wife for her advice. So he went to her. She was in the other room. He says, honey, you think I need to change? And he's standing there. And she looked at him from like a whole minute. Are you talking about your shirt? Because we all need to change. I know sometimes we can be focused on exterior stuff, tempo, temporary stuff. But the more important stuff is the internal stuff. We need to change. And we have to change our thinking if we're going to change our living. So we ought to address that with people. Now the question is, how do we do it? Jesus outlines how to do that. Right? He talks about going one-on-one -on -one and going in private. And so it's really important that we understand how we ought to approach people. First thing, I'm going to give you four characteristics of helping someone or addressing sin with someone to restore, restore another Christian. One is to do it gently. Gently. That, that Galatians 6 1 passage said it, right? It not only identified who, but the how. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Y'all see that? And it gives you a reason. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted, right? Because a lot of times we can get real judgmental. We can really talk about the sins we don't deal with. And you ought to be grateful. Right? We can talk about how, oh, my goodness, have you heard about such and such? They just, they just have just completely fallen away. And we can condemn these people and do it from the wrong attitude, right? Gentleness says, you know what? The thing that hit them could potentially hit me, right? Have you ever heard the, 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 the phrase, uh, but by the grace of God, there go I, everybody, right? That people can be in a situation and it's just God's grace that keeps you from that situation right there. In that moment. And so there's a gentleness that should happen. There is a dignity that we continue to extend to family members. I'm not broadcasting this thing to everybody. I'm not talking to my friend about it before I talk to you. I don't even bring the pastor into it before I talk to you. This is between you and I. Jesus says, keep it to yourself. Because your aim is to uplift, to restore your brother, your sister, right? You can't approach it like everybody's going to respond to things the way you respond to things. And so we ought to be gentle. The second thing is we ought to be progressive because what if they don't respond? And that's where it talks about the two or three, right? Go and find two or three other people. Now, why does Jesus bring up this two or three other thing? 
It, it comes from Deuteronomy 19.15. Deuteronomy 19.15 is dealing with legal stuff. And it talks about how can you levy a charge against somebody. It says it can't just be one person says and makes a, a, a charge against somebody. One person can't do it. There needs to be some witnesses, right? It's this whole idea that there's more than one side to every story. And so here's the benefit of having somebody else go with you. Having at least one other person who can be more objective, right? That's not taking your friend who always thinks and says the same way you do and signs off on everything that you say, right? Because we can set up the jury, right? You know how you, <laughs> you can set up the jury for conviction. No, no, you bring somebody in that's mature in the faith that can be objective because guess who might be wrong about the situation? You. <laughs> Instead of addressing them, they may need to address you and to give you a better understanding, to encourage you to be more patient or for you to not even have to deal with that particular issue. But in the event that you are right, they're not just hearing it from you. They're getting this love from a different perspective, and so it's progressive. It's looking at where they are and applying this love relative to where they are. My daughter taught me a lesson about this. Right? She's learning to drive. And she had driven before, and, you know, we had gone through the driving school, so now it's just about getting her hours behind the wheel. And I'm thinking, okay, well, let's just get in the car and go drive. She's like, where, right now, here yet? We're in the neighborhood. Let's just drive. Wait a minute. You know, I'm used to doing the parking lot. It's okay. You'll be fine. And we're driving, you know, and she is brand new, y'all. So, you know, we're in the medium. We're moving away from curves and all sorts of things. Cars are behind, and they're honking. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> and she's afraid. She's in a new place, new environment, new circumstances. And I'm the picture of, 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 of trust, you know. Now, she's scared to death. Guess what? I was scared to death, too. Yes, I was really scared. I was afraid. I was praying just as much as she was praying. I really was. Love you, sweetie. But here's what she said afterwards. She said, Dad, I wasn't ready for that. I needed more time in the parking lot. Right? And, and y'all, that registered with me. It wasn't that she didn't want to make the improvement, but she needed to have the improvement applied a certain way. And so now she's at a place where we can drive in the streets. But guess what? We went back to the parking lot. You don't just ramp this thing up. I know sin is deadly, y'all. Sin is an issue. But you don't just throw somebody out there. Let's just tell the whole church, you know, pastor, and I want to meet with you. No, no, y'all. I'm the last person you call. See where they are. Trust the Holy Spirit in loving them to change their mind. And as they change their mind, taking steps to change their living, it's progressive. But not only is it progressive, right? The thing we also have to be doing it with is with prayer. This isn't something you undergo on your own and in your own wisdom and understanding. You should be seeking God. And believe it or not, it's in this verse. You might have missed it. It's in verse 19. In verse 19, it says, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask. Do y'all see that? Jesus has implied through this whole process, starting from step one, you've been talking. You've been praying. You've been seeking direction and wisdom with each step, even though we have the recipe, right? The one-on-one -on -one and the two or three, and then if it's not the two or three with the church, you're in communication the whole time. And the moment it gets out of that one person, before you talk to that person, you're talking with God. And God says, you may not be seeing the things that you hope to see on earth, right? You're not necessarily seeing the changes that you hope to see right away. But as you pray and you're following God's way, you're not seeing things on earth, but there's a whole lot of activity happening in heaven. 
He says, if you two agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Do y'all see that? That's the word of God. Now, y'all, that's not pixie dust. That's not wishing for, you know, mansions and boats to drive on the water. You know, that's not talking about that. It's talking about things in accordance with the will of God. You've heard me talk about 1 John 5, 14, and 15 before, right? If we ask anything according to his will, then we know that he hears, and if he hears us, we know that we have what we ask for. But guess what the application of that was? The next verse, 1 John 5, 16, says this. 1 John 5, 16 says this. It says that... uh, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there's a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. Now, what in the world is this sin that leads to death? Y'all, we know from the New Testament, so certain things can be deadly. What kind of things? They're spiritual things. Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts lied to the Holy Spirit. People were giving and supporting one another, and they lied about their gift and died. In 1 Corinthians 15, they were taking communion in an unworthy manner. You know when we talk about examining yourself? Right? They were just eating food, and they were eating, and people was hungry, and they didn't even get something to eat, and it was just losing the meaning. He said, for that reason, some of you have fallen sick, and some have even died. Right? Tells you again just how critical and how dangerous sin can be, especially with the stuff of God. But look how powerful prayer is. He says, if it's anything outside of death, and you guys are praying for it, God's going to do it. How often in your prayer life, right? We pray about our meals, we pray about our children, pray about jobs and all sorts of stuff. How often are you praying about somebody's repentance? Right? Because the job stuff is a hope so prayer. But when you are moving and addressing and loving someone to be in right relationship with God, it's not a hope so prayer, it's a no so prayer. I know this will happen. So we got gently, we got progressively, we got prayerfully. The last thing is faithfully. Faithfully. Genuinely trusting God to work through this process, right? Because what makes us uncomfortable is if things progress, right? Because it talks about if they don't listen to the church, then treat them as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. So we need to know something about the culture, y'all. Jews didn't like either one of those. Tax collectors were Jews who were looked at as betraying their own people to a foreign government. And Gentiles were looked at as being unclean spiritually, right? They didn't know God and they worshiped false gods. And so the culture did not look well upon them. And so they would shun them. And Jesus is saying, for that brother or sister who you've been praying for, who you've been dealing with personally, privately, and then you finally went to, to get somebody else and y'all approached them and talked to them and prayed. And it's not talking about a one-to-one. You might have done that five, 50 times. And then it says, and even, did y'all remember reading that? It says, even if they don't listen to the church, right? Because it's really not expected to get that far. This is an unusual event. This is a hard-hearted individual who would say, I'd rather hold on to this sinful behavior than to submit to the church. Right? You got to think about that. There's only a handful of things that you ought to hold to no matter what. And all of them are somewhere in this Bible. There's no other principle that is worth rejecting the body of Christ for. Right? Paul talks about, listen, I like barbecue. In the book of Romans, I love me some barbecue. But if it calls you to slip, I will be vegan. I'm paraphrasing. I won't say vegan, I'll say vegetarian, because I think something vegan might be sinful. That's just my personal opinion. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's a joke. Kind of joke. <laughs> but he talks about how important the relationship is over something he knew to not be an issue in himself. 
And so if somebody at the church as a whole, they're coming to you that something to you is really not that big of a deal. The mindset of a Christian is submit for their sake. And it says if a person holds on to something, even after being approached and prayed over and the whole church has come, if they get to that point, then you need to treat them like the wayward person that they are. Right? And we try to Christianize that. Okay, well, treat them like an unbeliever. That means we're even more gracious to them. No, 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 no. They can still come to worship. And you say good morning to them. But you ain't hanging out with them. It's not the same. That's the example we have from the Scripture. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 through 15 says, If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them. Why? That they may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. In 1 Corinthians 5, it, it puts it in more stark uh, detail. It talks about delivering them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. And that sounds so horrible. And it's because it's supposed to be. But it sounds unchristian. No, it's one of the most Christian things you can do with a person whose heart is hard in that way, right? Because it, it doesn't say give them over to Satan for their destruction, for the destruction of their flesh. It's talking about the root of what they're holding on to. In that instance in 1 Corinthians 5, this person was okay and the church was okay with him marrying his stepmother and being with his stepmother. And he's saying, no, 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 no. We're not going to slander God that way. And he is in his flesh and he needs to have something to happen with his flesh. And the only way that's going to happen is him being apart from the people of faith. He needs to feel it. Y'all know the story of the prodigal son? This is the son that had the father's uh, uh, benefit. He, he got his inheritance early, and he went off to a distant land, right? And he had all his wealth, and he squandered it. He squandered it. There was a famine that came, and so all this money went away real quick, right? He was like me. Dollar, the, 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 the cereal went to $4.64. Y'all know what cereal is $4.64 now. It really is. And he lost everything. And he had to sell them out eating pig food. But it was being broke. And in the pig pen that he came to his senses and made the decision to go back to his father. Y'all, if they get to the point where they don't want to listen no matter what and who comes, we need to let them go. Because God, if they are a child of God, is going to have a pig pen for them. And it looks so horrible and it feels so horrible, but it's the best thing for them. Because it's the place that they come to their senses. Repentance is the aim. And you have to trust God through the whole process. And when they don't want to move, you just give it to God. And that's the best place they can be. Y'all, I, I don't know if I told y'all the story when I was on this plane. I flew, I was, this is when I was working as a land manager for a petrochemical company. And they had just bought this plant out in Ohio. And it was in a small town outside of Toledo. So I flew into Cleveland. And from Cleveland, I had to fly to, fly to Toledo. So y'all, they put me on this plane that was about the size of a bus. I'm telling you the truth. So it's three seats across, two seats on one side and one, an aisle, and then one seat on the other side. That's how big this plane is. It's got propellers, and it sounds like a weed eater. That's how it sounded to me. <laughs> Y'all, we go up in the air, and I experience the worst turbulence of my life. I've never had that kind. I'm talking about the movie kind of turbulence. Y'all know what I'm talking about in the movies? When, you know, somebody, something happens to the pilot and somebody from the back says, hey, I'm flying the plane now. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's the kind of turbulence we hit. It was bad. I'm talking about it was bad when people, you know, when we'd hit turbulence and people would do that scream laughter. You know, that. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I 
You know, and I'm wondering, Lord, why am I screaming like this? You know? <laughs> that was bad. It was bad. Let me tell you how bad it was. This is a true story. I'm not lying. Y'all, the, 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 the flight attendant came out with the drink cart and gave out drinks for free and sat down and got his own drink. I am not lying. So I knew, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm not a flight attendant. This is bad for me. But him to sit down and drink with us, this was bad. Somebody said, well, is anybody praying? I said, look here, I've been praying the whole time. But you know the worst thing I could have done in that situation, as, as frightening as it was, with all the uncertainty, was to lead a plane. <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be the worst thing I could do? You know what? This is just too bad. I'm jumping ship. I'll open the door and hop out, right? That, that sounds ridiculous, but that's what we'll do. We'll quit on God in the 12th grade, right? You've gone through all this stuff where you've been walking and trusting him, and then it gets real bad. And you say, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. And that's quitting school in the 12th grade. Be faithful. Trust him through the whole process. It's the word of God that says, he who began a good work in you will do what? Carry it on to the day of completion and the day of Christ Jesus, right? He's going to finish what he started. Just stay in the seat, and you'll end up where you need to be. So y'all need y'all to think about this. I need y'all to think. You know, I've been, we're talking about this. What, what, what's the application? I know what you're thinking. Okay, there's that person I need to talk to. There's that person in my life, and they're just living the wrong way. And I want you to be thinking about the broken relationships that you have, right? That, that there's probably some sin, some kind of way involved with every bro broken relationship in your life. And I want you to have a talk with that person. But the first person I want you to talk to is yourself. Where did I miss the mark? Right? Right? Jesus says, before you try to deal with that speck in your brother's eye, deal with the plank in your own eye. Because he says, then you'll be in a better position, have a better perspective to help your brother, to help your sister, to help your children, to help your coworker. Examine those broken relationships and seek God and say, where was I missing the mark? And then change your thinking. And then seek him in reconciling that relationship. Don't wait, y'all. A person who's in a far place is in a dangerous place. And you want to do all that you can to help them, to rescue them. I say I want you to start with yourself but I also don't want you to start with your relationship with another person. I want you to start with your relationship with God. Am I where I need to be with God? Right? Because it talked about the spiritual person should go to the wayward person. And so if I'm not spiritual, then I need to go to the spirit before I can be spiritual and spiritual with somebody else. And so where are you? in your walk. There's a, a, a beautiful passage in James where James talks about the blessing of, a, of addressing uh, a person who's lost their way. Now, it, it says here in, in, in James chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, I, I used to serve at a church called Good Hope Missionary Baptist Church, and it's on McGregor, North McGregor. North McGregor is a one-way street. The other side is South McGregor. And I remember I was going to work one day, and I was actually coming up from Alameda. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually going... Uh, down South McGregor, where I'll have to U-turn to come back up North McGregor to go to church. And as I'm getting ready, coming to the light, there at the freeway, 288 in South McGregor, someone turns on South McGregor going in my direction. 
And, and some of you may you've experienced that before. And it was myself and another car coming right at this person. And we started honking our horns and yelling. And somebody who, that didn't know the situation would probably would think, man, that's so rude. Why are they yelling at this person? Why are they honking their horns at this person and treating them this way? We're treating them this way because they headed the wrong direction. If they keep going in that direction, not only will they hurt themselves, but they're going to hurt somebody else. And so I'm going to do everything I can to get their attention, to help them to understand you need to turn around. Y'all, the same thing is true in your family. It's true in this, this church building right now. It's true with the people you work with and go to school. They're going down the wrong street. And you happen to know the right way. Don't be afraid to love them. But also, check the sign yourself. Make sure you are headed the right way. If you're watching right now and you don't know, maybe you recognize you haven't been going the right way, I want to encourage you to put your trust in Jesus Christ. If you don't know the right way, then find the person who knows the right way, right? That's the best thing you can do. And Jesus is the way, right? He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so if you've never put your trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that. If you're going and trying to live this life apart from the family of God, the people of God, then you're going to be going the wrong way more often than you should. As a family, we help one another to stay on this path and following Jesus. And so I want you to really reflect where you are right now. If you're in this place or if you're watching online, what do I need to change? How do I need to think differently, right? I, I like to live my own life. I need to live, like to live my own way. But if my way is in the wrong direction, I need to make a change. If you're ready to make that change, we invite you to connect with us. You can go online to thewayoflifechurch.com slash connect. You can text connect. And we will talk to you privately one-on-one -on -one to help you to understand and to facilitate you being equipped to living things, living life the way the author of life would have you to live it. Well, listen, I want to thank you guys uh, for being patient and taking this time with us in this word. Hopefully you, now you understand that the two or three is about God authorizing you, Jesus saying he signs off on your efforts to love another believer in the right way and in the right direction. Well, listen, if God says the same, um, if we're able to come back next week, we're going to continue this series, and we're going to learn is peace the way that we understand the will of God, right? His inner peace, right? I got a peace, so it must be God's will. Well, maybe. We'll talk about it next Sunday if he says the same. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for this blessing. And God, I thank you for being the, the blessing of having your truth and your Holy Spirit. God, help us to live it out. Help us to be repentant to our sins. You have written this to let us know that we are going to sin. But sometimes we need help in turning away from it. And so I pray, God, that we will be reflective on our own lives, and be an encouragement to the, those around us. God, if it's not your will for us to see you in glory face to face, bless us to come together and celebrate you all over again next week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.